Hi, I'm Emmy Yardley, and I am not a designer, which is going to become quite apparent when you see my slides. But I am honored to be here uh, at a design conference and among all of these very interesting people with incredibly inspiring stories. So thank you for having me. I am going to be spending the next 20 minutes talking about robots and humans and delight. And like a few of the speakers from yesterday, I'm going to be reiterating how important empathy is in this conversation. To get started, I wanted to talk a little bit about why I care about design. This story starts when I was in school and I had this vision of what I wanted to study. I had always loved taking things apart and figuring out how they worked so that I could put them back together again. And this interest went well beyond stuff. It extended to people and society, really figuring out what makes us tick. And fast forward to college, I was geeking out a bit on artificial intelligence. I wanted to find new ways of interacting with the human mind and engaging with a combination of technology and philosophy. And totally by accident, I stumbled across a program called Symbolic Systems, which combines the disciplines of computer science, linguistics, psychology, and philosophy. But really, it was all about taking things apart, figuring out how they worked, and then trying to put them back together again. So after college, I started working at startups because life is random, and that is where I ended up getting my first job. But since then, I have built up a lot of experience working in some very well-established, very traditional, and now antiquated industries, including books and publishing at Barnes & Noble, where I was literally taking a world of ink and paper and bringing it online into the digital world. And I did this for a bunch of companies in advertising and news and information. And in each of these industries, it became my job to take an existing system apart, figure out how it worked, and then put it back together again, just in a different medium. And I discovered that this is really hard because you can't just take one medium and translate it to a completely different medium and expect it to operate in exactly the same way. Some of these paper-based industries really know their customers. And after decades of experience, they have really figured out how to delight them. But when they've then brought these experiences online, so often that great experience becomes a giant tire fire. And it has become my job to avoid that tire fire, to take the delight that people had in one medium and figure out how to translate that into a different medium. So right now I work in banking as the VP of product at a technology company called Simple. And banking is a great field for me to work in because the customer experience at a whole lot of banks right now smells like burning tires. Simple is a technology company that is changing the way that people bank and think about their money. We offer a debit card, online banking services, and tools to help people set goals and save money. And Simple's mission is to help people feel confidence with their money. My personal mission and my team's mission is to delight our customers. Customer delight goes beyond solving for people's needs and speaks to pleasing them in ways that were completely unexpected. This delight is what creates a strong emotional connection between product, brand, and customer. And it's that strong connection that we're building that makes people continue to want to use our products. Money management and savings are not things that people typically get excited about on their own. <laughs> They're more in line with the Eat Your Wheaties category of life activities. But helping people feel confident with their money is a big mission that requires an extended, trusting relationship that lasts over a long period of time. And it's that personal connection that we develop with our customers that keeps people eating those Wheaties over the course of their lives so that they're around long enough to really benefit from Simple's products. And we accomplish our mission thanks to design. That being said, design and banking do not typically go hand in hand. So for example, who here has recently logged into their bank account online and then paused to admire what a beautiful experience you had doing that? <laughs> oh, great, one. Oh, you use simple, nice. <laughs> okay, one more question. So who here would use the word beautiful to describe their relationship with money? That's another one. Don't typically get too many positive responses. The reality is that not many people think of their bank or their relationship with money as being beautiful. And that is exactly what we're up against. These things don't typically go hand in hand. But for simple to succeed, we really have to get the design right. And like I said before, I'm not a designer by trade nor by practice, but I do spend all day every day thinking about how we design our products in a way 
that delights our customers. And for me, it's come down to a simple equation with three parts. Robots plus humans equals delight. Now, this may sound a little bit simplified or even a bit wonky. We are going to step through it one piece at a time. And let's start with robots. So first, what do we mean at Simple when we talk about robots? We are not just talking about C3PO or other mechanical humanoids, and we're not just talking about some other artificial intelligence. At Simple, we use the word robot to describe automation by any sort of technical agents, some piece of technology that performs a task or collects data on your behalf, things that you couldn't normally do yourself. Your phone, your computer, the internet, even this clicker, all of it could be considered the robot. Sometimes it's simple, we get really broad, and we use the robot as a synonym to refer to all of technology and all of the data we receive from that technology. So these robots are pretty awesome, but many people dislike or distrust robots. Why is that? There are a bunch of reasons. Robots are opaque. When they don't work as expected, it can be difficult to figure out what went wrong and how to fix it. Robots are generally one-size-fits-all, offering the same automation to everybody. Robots take away control, and that can be scary. And robots can be inefficient. No one in the history of customer service has ever called up their bank, their health insurance provider, um, their cable company, their cell phone company, their airline, and exclaimed with delight, oh, yeah, an automated phone menu. <laughs> Instead, a lot of us have probably been in the situation where we find ourselves shouting repeatedly into our phones, representative. <sighs> right, that happens to me all the time. That being said, there are plenty of great things about robots too. Robots can do math more consistently than humans. Robots can remember a lot more things than humans, and they never forget things. Robots are great at collecting lots and lots of data about what our customers like and what they don't. Robots do exactly what you tell them to do, nothing more, nothing less. They are very well behaved in that way. Robots can be available at all times of day, every single day. And for simple, uh, repetitive tasks, robots are often the best. For example, I trust my alarm clock to get me up on time every morning. And I could ask my husband to do it, he'd be pretty good. But on occasion, he will be a little bit late and sometimes he'll sleep in. So while my husband's pretty consistent, my alarm clock works every single time. Now, what these robots end up looking like in your product really depends on what problem you're trying to solve. So let's start with a math problem. We have a feature called Safe to Spend, which we developed when we noticed that people were doing mental math each time they went to use their debit card. They were trying to figure out if they had enough money to spend on the thing that they wanted to buy. So really, this robot is just doing some basic math and telling people what they can spend today without hurting themselves tomorrow. The robot's doing math that people have been doing on cocktail napkins in the backs of envelopes for a very long time. We just built it right in, so now people don't have to do that math themselves. So now the robot does the math, and there's much less room for error because the robot is great at math, and it never forgets anything. How about an automation problem? Everyone wants to save. No one actively seeks to burn through all of their money. But it is very, very difficult to put things away in a controlled, consistent manner over time. So we introduced goals, which allow you to set up tiny recurring deposits in a goal that you save for over time. This simple bit of automation makes the process effortless, whereas if we were to give this task to a human, they might easily forget. And then there's the problem of not having enough time in the day. Imagine you are packing for a trip, you have booked a hotel, and you're really excited to get where you're going, and then at the last minute, you realize that you have forgotten to tell your bank that you are on your way to Costa Rica. Calling us up takes your time, it takes our time, but most importantly, it takes you away from the human side of that travel experience. So we gave this task to a robot, and we made it really, really easy for you to fill out a form right from your phone from the security line at an airport. And it takes about 30 seconds to fill out and hit send. So thanks to robots, these features give us perfect math, perfect automation, and excellent speed, which are all outstanding robot-like qualities. And now that we've talked about robots, Let's talk about humans. Humans are great, but we are also messed up in a lot of ways. <laughs> How are humans flawed? Well, we have emotions, and emotions can be complicated. They lead to all sorts of illogical and irrational actions. Humans get tired and bored when doing repetitive tasks, and we make mistakes. 
And humans need to sleep. We cannot be on 24 hours a day. That being said, like robots, there are many beautiful and wonderful things about humans. Humans can pick up on and interpret other people's needs in a way that robots just can't. Humans have nuance. We don't always say what we mean or mean what we say, which is both a beautiful and sometimes frustrating thing. Humans, what they're really great at is personalization. Humans have empathy, and we know that every other person is unique, and one approach doesn't necessarily work well for everybody. And you might remember me saying earlier that data is one of the things that's a strength of robots, but it's also a thing that's a strength of humans. It just looks very different as an output. It could be a conversation that someone on your customer relations team has on the phone with a customer, or it could be feedback that you get during a research session when customers are answering questions about their interaction with your product. As you could probably guess from this equation that we've been working with, the best thing that you can do is to include data from both the human and the robot side. It's hard to say which is more important, because it all helps us get out of our own heads and into our, the heads of our customers. And all of this data is key for bringing about empathy, that ability to understand the feelings and motivations of other people. It's empathy that enables you to build the emotional connection with your customers that creates delight. So now let's go back to those examples of where simple used robots to solve problems, but add in a layer of empathy for what our customers really need. Safe to spend solves a math problem, but without personalization, it wouldn't have the same impact. Safe to spend is not one size fits all. It caters to your individual transactions, your savings goals, and the bills that you have set up and are planning to pay. It gives you an accurate picture of what's available to spend based on your personal financial situation. We've put as much personalization into this product as we can without having a human do our customers' budgets by hand. Goals are all about automation, but they're also about emotion because our goals are all so personal. My husband and I live almost 3,000 miles away from our families, so we're constantly setting up goals around birthdays and other life events so we can make sure that we can be there for those key times. And we never have to worry about whether we'll be able to make it out there to see our relatives because we're saving for these goals a little bit each week. And when we look at our goals in Simple's interface, we see what's important to us. So in many ways, this is a reflection of ourselves and our aspirations. The little things like the travel notification forms offer speed, but what they are really offering is peace of mind. So yes, we build these things to reduce friction for our customers, but we know from firsthand that letting your bank know about your travel plans typically happens at a particularly stressful point in time when you have dozens of other things on your to-do list. So now instead, people are heading off on their vacations a little bit more calm and much less frazzled. And this is what I mean when I talk about combining both technology and human factors to arrive at delight. And the frustrating thing about banking and the process of moving banking from the paper-based world to the digital world is that delight used to be there. The banking industry used to have everything it needed to delight its customers. Historically, banks were much smaller. They were community-focused, they invested money locally, and you knew your bank manager and the tellers. If you went to them for a loan, they knew who you were, they knew what your business looked like, and they knew what you needed. And they can make very well-informed decisions because of this. So banks were actually able to offer personalized service delivered by actual humans. But then along came massive bank consolidation and the move from physical branches to ATMs and online services. And now everyone hates their bank and there's not even an opportunity to create a personal connection between banker and customer because no one ever goes into a bank branch unless they absolutely have to. And this is a real problem for banking because repeated habitual use of a product has a lot to do with the emotional connection that your customers feel. And if you sever that emotional connection, you're also severing any loyalty that customer might have had. What's inherently challenging about industries such as banking and healthcare and insurance is that people come into these spaces with a bunch of preloaded, stressful emotions. But wherever there is emotion, there's opportunity for delight. If these inherently emotional industries would build for those emotions, then they could help their customers overcome long-standing fears and confusion to build new habits. Because with supportive, personalized tools, people can understand more complicated concepts like how to save money or select an insurance plan. And they can move from a place of fear and anxiety and frustration into a place of confidence. We've seen firsthand how approachable, accessible tools, even delightful tools that people enjoy using, can impact positive change. 
For instance, simple customers have a personal savings rate of 10% versus the industry average of less than 5%. Now, while this is indeed exactly what delight looks like, and that is exactly what we're going for, for this delight to have a real impact, it has to be perpetuated. Take, for example, what happened with our blocked card feature. Did you know that Simple was the first company to add a button in our application that lets you immediately block your card right from your phone? This is something that a lot of you probably have built into your banking apps at this point. But when we introduced this feature three years ago, people lost their minds. They were so excited. But Delight does not last forever. At this point, a feature like this is considered table stakes, something that people just expect to be there. This thing that we created three years ago was incredibly delightful. But by now, it's just another thing that people expect. Perpetuating Delight does not always have to come from major product moments. It could come from taking the time to translate a heavily legalese email into something more readable, for example. So every bank, no matter what, each year is legally required to send all of their customers an update to their privacy policy and the very relatable regulation e-disclosures. So instead of copying and pasting the required text, our teams took this as an opportunity for education. We sent an email translating the legal language into digestible, clear human language. And this show of empathy with quite a bit of personality delighted our customers to such an extent that this fed enormous amounts of delight back into the organization when a handful of these grateful customers reached out to us with their own handwritten letters. December 2nd, 2015. Dear Simple. Dearest Simple. Dear Simple. To the Fluffy Feather Rider. The world is your oyster. Thank you so much for your email, which was titled Rabble, Rabble, Rabble. Translation. Legally required annual celebration of privacy policy updates. Upon receiving your email updating your privacy policies, I was dismayed to learn that you have rarely received paper mail. Horrors. I decided to fix that. I hope you enjoy what is quite possibly your first letter. Exciting. May I have a picture of you writing me back with the fluffiest of feather quills? I couldn't stand the idea of you never getting real letters. So here's an inspirational oyster. In order to kick off this special occasion, I send you my nicest cardstock. As you can see, it features my favorite animal, a squirrel. Here's a drawing of a ferret. I just wanted to say I love simple and its take on what banking should be. It has really helped me in saving for my upcoming wedding. I'd wish you all a sunny day, but that's probably a far-fetched wish. So instead, I wish you a microbrew-filled day. A happy and more educated customer. I love what you guys are doing. Stay awesome, Simple. Stay awesome. Happy holidays, and thank you for everything you do. <laughs> <laughs> that video and those cards and those moments of delight are absolutely worth the time and the care that it takes to build a product in this way. And when your customers are proactively sharing their delight with you, this acts as inspiration rocket fuel within your organization. When you are thinking about design, think about listening, first and foremost, and getting into your customers' shoes. Because if you want to create delight, it all comes down to empathy. For us, we need both robots and humans to make the most empathetic decisions. For you and your organization, that might depend based on who you're designing for and what medium you're building in. But if you want to delight, you have to exercise your empathy to get to the heart of what people really need. So with that, I encourage all of you to go forth and delight. Thank you.